Okay. We're going to start. And I ran through these last time. Uh, I'll do it again. Keep in mind throughout this class, and with this book and every book, when the author makes a statement, feel free to challenge it because we, you don't have to buy everything that's in the book okay. or every chapter or every page. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater <laughs> uh, because you, there may be a statement you don't agree with, but there are probably other gems that you can get from the book, just like any book. So I'm just reminding you of that. Uh, and the obvious conclusion as you read through may not be the, the, the correct one. So often just think about the issue. Uh, and uh, nobody has to come to an immediate conclusion, although we do want to hear your discussion and discussion is encouraged, uh, but please keep in the, your remarks fairly short uh, so that there's time for other people to all get here. Okay, so that, that's basic guidelines for the class. I said, okay, said those last week, I'm repeating them today, and I may repeat them again. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Good reminders. And then, okay. very important thing, yeah. um, is that uh, we really do need to end class on time. Uh, so I have my alarm set for 10 minutes after 10. And when that goes off, we got five minutes left. And I'm gonna do a couple things here real quick for the sake of the folks here. I'm gonna hide the video panel. And that way uh, we don't obscure part of the slide. So your, Jane did your part clock of the, is crooked. I, I know <laughs> because life is not this time is flying. Off. Time is flying away yes. from us. And it's flying away from us. Yeah, that's all part of the metaphor. <laughs> okay. I know. It's kind of I know, a little disconcerting. Yeah. Uh, that's next really time I'll give you a different clock. I'll try to give you one that's straight. <laughs> so no conclusions. Okay, so uh next up is keep in mind that last week I did part two of chapter two. The previous week Jane did part one. Chapter two. <laughs> Today I'm doing part three of chapter two, and somebody's going to have to do part four <laughs> next week because I'm not going to cover it all. Okay, it's just it's just too, too much. much. There really is. And and my apologies, but I'm going to steal this from Coral. I went down several rabbit holes. <laughs> I, I just and I'll explain a couple of them here. One is the author talks about origin, and I had to know who origin was. Okay, so I, I did some more digging into origin and what he believed and wrote. And the second one is that um, she talks about, in, the, in this middle part of the chapter, she talks about the differences between the language used to re describe Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels versus John. <coughs> now, that we don't even get to Thomas yet. Uh, that's in... Part four. <laughs> um, but every time she made those references, I wanted to be sure that I understood what she was saying. And to be honest, I wanted to double check her. I wanted to be sure that what she was saying was, was accurate. And for the most part, it is, although I found a couple variations. So we're going to go down that rabbit hole of whose origin. Or we're going to go down to another one, which talks about who, you know, where, how Jesus is, re is referred to in the different gospels and why. Okay, so starting <coughs> on John's intentions and synoptic differences. Um, like the cleansing of the temple, she says, the author says, the story of Lazarus points to deeper meanings. The chief priests have Jesus arrested because they fear his power. Okay, so that um, that's one aspect of why he was headed to the cross. And the thing that they were most concerned about ties in with the story of Lazarus. And that is that he had the power to raise the dead. And in popular vernacular, it scared the bejesus out of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so they wanted to they wanted to kill him. They wanted to get rid of Jesus. And by the way, before Dennis can correct me, it's the high priests who were fearful. 
it was Romans who ultimately killed him. So uh, it wasn't the Jews. It was the high priests who were in charge of the temple who were fearful and managed to finagle it so that the Romans crucified him. <clears throat> okay, the other gospel writers see Jesus as human. Now that in this case, we're talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, John sees him as Alpha and Omega. Uh, so it's a little bit different. Um, and we're going to come back and define all those terms, Messiah, King, Son of Man, Son of God, etc. So this gets us to the point where we talk about the Egyptian teacher origin of Alexandria. Uh, he became one of John's earliest defenders. And so I wanted to say, okay, if that's true, I want to see it in print. So uh, I'm going to show you the in print part in just a moment, moment here. The first thing I ask myself is, who's Origen? And he's a third century Christian scholar and theologian. Uh, he's been described as the greatest genius or thinker of the early church. And he wrote several massive works. One is the first principles. I can't pronounce the Latin or the Greek name of it, but I'll just, we'll just call it the first principles. And it was a landmark work that systematically laid out the foundations of Christian theology. Okay, so, um, but not everything he stated re remains as part of Christian theology. Uh, he also wrote commenta commentaries on Matthew, Luke, John, Romans, and more. And the one that he wrote on John is the one that we're most interested in. So here's, here's a, a part of it. And I've highlighted a couple parts, and I'm going to try to read this to you, but I'm I'm fumbling on my words this morning, so I uh, beg my pardon if I, I screwed up. So the Gospels being four, and by the way, I've, I've shortened some parts of this, but it, it doesn't, I tried not to change the intent, the original intent. The Gospels being four, I deem the first fruits, in other words, the best, most complete of the Gospels to be the Gospel of John that which speaks of him whose genealogy had already been set forth, but which begins to speak of him at a point before he had any genealogy. What the heck does that mean? In the beginning in, was the word. Yeah, in, in the beginning. Matthew talks about the genealogy, the earthly genealogy of Jesus. But John talks about his genealogy going all the way back to be, before the creation of the earth. So that's what that's what Origen is referring to. Um, Matthew writing for the Hebrews who looked for him who was to come of the line of Abraham and, and, and of David. And Mark, knowing what he writes, narrates the beginning of the gospel. In other words, he, Mark gives us the beginning of the gospel, but John gives us the conclusion. We find what he aims at in John. In the beginning of the word, God, the word, God the Word. But Luke says at the beginning of Acts, the former treaty, treatise, treatise uh, meaning Luke's gospel. You remember, this is, he's referring back to Acts, which is most people agree, most scholars believe that Acts and Luke were written by the same person. The former treatise, Luke's gospel, I made about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Yet Luke's, yet Luke leaves to him who lay on Jesus' breast, John, the beloved, the greatest and completest discourse about Jesus. For none of those, none of these plainly declared his Godhead as John does. Uh, John does. And I've slaughtered that, but you, hopefully you get the impression. <clears throat> Origen is saying, John is the first one who really plainly declares the Godhead of Jesus. Um, he, uh, he does that when he makes him say, I am the light of the world. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the resurrection. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. And in the apocalypse, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. We may therefore boldly say that the gospels are the first fruits of all the scriptures, but that of all the gospels, John is the first fruits. No one can apprehend the meaning of it except he that has 
laid on Jesus' breast and received from Jesus that Mary is to be his mother also. So he's describing John, the beloved, who <clears throat> rested his head on, on Jesus' breast during the Last Supper and who received of Mary the charge to take care of his mother. Okay, so so I agree with <laughs> I agree agree with Pagels in this issue. Origen does defend John over the synoptics. And he at least says that it that John talks about the Godhead where the others did not. Okay? Make sense? Questions and comments. That's from the commentary on the Gospel of John, book one. And there are several books to it. That, that, yes. that very last sentence, Jonathan, mm -hmm. you think Origen is saying that, you know, it was basically when Jesus was on the cross and he looked down at, at yes. John and Mary. Yes. There's mm -hmm. been a, I've always wondered, is, is he actually calling John his brother at that time? Or it's a, it's John the Beloved. I know that. And, mm -hmm. and he charges him to take care of Mary. I, I think all Origen is referring to here is the, that Mary is... He is to take Mary as his mother. Sort of he, like he, symbolically. He is to adopt her as a mother. He's okay. to take care of her. That makes right. that makes sense. Okay. okay. It was it was typical in those days for for a widow, you know, someone who was her caretaker passed away that it would then pass on to another family member. And I think John, even though he wasn't maybe physically a, a biologically a brother to Jesus, yeah. very much was so in the sense of okay. you know, yeah. their relationship. Yeah. So okay. kind of an adoption. But the important part of that phrase or that that passage is that, you know, he's the first gospel to declare the, the godhood of right. Jesus. Yeah. Now, there's, he's the first one of the four to basically say Jesus is God. Okay. Now, we're going to delve into that more and we'll see if, if we totally agree with that or not. So let's go back to John, and I'm using the New American Standard Bible because when I did several references, and I've used it all the way through here, when I did several references, it says it gets either four or five stars for being closest to the Greek and two stars for readability. Well, I wasn't so concerned about readability, but I was trying to get us as close as possible uh, to what current modern scholars say is what the Greek said. Okay, but we're going to have fun with that later on, believe me. <laughs> so, in the beginning was the Word, and again, this is John's concept of Logos, and in some versions it says Logos. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Who's he? Jesus. Jesus, of course. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay, so this is John's premise that in the beginning, and this he's arguing for the pre existence of Jesus back with the creation. And it's interesting when you read through this, the very ne next verse starts talking about John, but it's John the Baptist. Okay. So I think he's trying to be clear that this is going to be talking about the word, which is Jesus. And then he says, oh, and by the way, we're going to start talking about John, John the Baptist. And interrupt me at any point, please, if you have questions. Uh, in ancient Greek philosophy and early Christian theology, Logos was the rational creative principle that permeates the universe. What does that mean? belief was that God could just say the word and things happen. Okay. But there was also a logical, mm -hmm. rational progression of things. Mm -hmm. It all it all stemmed from God. In Greek thought, the concept of logos appears at first in the 6th century BCE, that's before Christ, philosopher, philosopher Her Heraclides. Heraclides, mm -hmm. sorry. 
uh, who saw in the cosmic process a logos analogous to the reasoning power in humans. Okay, so God thinks, things happen. But it's all logical, it's all rational. Logos supports basic Christian doctrine of Jesus Christ pre-existence. And that goes back to in the beginning. You know, literally, the three synoptic gospels start at some point within the life of Jesus and go on from there. John starts with the beginning of creation. It acts on all human beings through their capacity for logic and rational thought. What does that say to you? Uh -huh. That we're able to figure things out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, human beings have the capability to think, to, to uh, logically, rationally approach issues, and our belief should be based on that too. Okay. And logos guides humans to the truth of God's revelation. Okay, so those are all concepts of early Christianity or uh, early Christian thought and Greeks uh, view of Logos. Uh, origin and Logos. So here, let's talk specifically about origin. As humans progress in their rational thinking, all humans become more like Christ. Sound acceptable? That's what Origin said? This is Origin. So they, mm -hmm. they progress. As they, through their rational thinking, Humans can become more like Christ. However, we retain our individuality and do not become subsumed in Christ. Okay. Would that be um, in some ways complementary but distinct from, say, Buddhism or some Eastern religion where you want to, it's like you become the universe? Yeah. In a way, yeah, it, or you lose your individuality um, as the ultimate goal. Okay, it's been a while since I've studied that, but it seems to me like it. Nirvana is basically becoming one with the universe, and and that's the highest level in Buddhism, I believe. I hope I'm saying that correctly. But here in Christianity, we retain our individuality. Creation came into existence only through the Logos, through the Word, the essence of essences and the idea of ideas. So it's it's that kernel of creation. I, I like that. I just like that, the essence of essences and idea of ideas. However, <clears throat> this is where Origen gets into trouble. He also exposed the pre-existence of all souls. Now, how many of you have ever heard the concept that before we are born, we are and we pre-exist, and God chooses us to go in, into a certain family or a certain situation. Or anybody ever hear that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I don't know if I heard that you were destined to a particular family. Okay. But yeah, I heard that. No, well, well, my mother always told me I was. <laughs> <laughs> I so, always heard these are there. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. But the, the whole idea is he believed in the pre-existence of souls. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? I said I did good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> good. Not everybody is so lucky. Yeah, that's true. So well, discerning. Yeah, I was I was lucky too. Um, he he was anti-Nicene Creed. Hmm. He believed the Son inferior to God, and that, of course. I didn't put it here, but the Holy Spirit is subservient to Jesus uh, or inferior, either hard either hard. word. How did you rationalize that? Well, you know, he just got done talking about Jesus as the creator of the universe, and Jesus is perfect, as God is perfect. How 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 can you have inferiority in that situation? I, I was going to ask him, but I just couldn't get through. <laughs> um, I, that's I, a fourth century aneurysm right there yeah. oh, <laughs> <Aneurysm>. <laughs> yeah. 
I think it's area music. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm having an um, area. <laughs> if I had to speculate, keep in mind that um, early Christianity uh, grew up in a time period where there were multiple gods, uh, some more powerful than others. My guess is that if you, even though Jesus was there at, at the moment of creation, that somehow he was somewhat lesser than God the Father. Uh, so he uh, he spiritualized away the res resurrection of the, the body. What does that mean? Well, there was disagreement as to whether resurrection is a physical or a spiritual event. And okay. So it sounds like he advocated for the spiritual side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so specifically with regard to Jesus, he would say that Jesus' res resurrection was spiritual only, not in body. That it was the spirit that people saw, not the physical body of, of Jesus, which is somewhat contrary to uh, standard Christian belief in that uh, you know, Peter feels the, the wounds in Jesus' hands. So there's some, some conflict there. But, but the important thing here, I think, to take from all this is and that in those early centuries, there was a lot of dispute about what Christianity really meant. And I was thinking about it uh, as I was reading through some of this material. When you think about Paul and Peter and the other apostles going into other areas, and each one has their own view of what Jesus' message meant to them, and they're sharing that, and what props up are all these groups with slightly variant views, which is why... They needed the different councils of the church to bring it all back together. And that's why uh, the idea that the Son is inferior to the Father, Father and the Holy Ghost is inferior to the Son was squashed uh, because uh, the Nicene Creed talks about three and one. The, you know, the three. Um, he de denied hell, uh, or this is an origin, and accused of turning Christianity into a kind of Gnosticism, which I thought was kind of interesting because uh, he supported Paul, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, John, he supported John, who basically wrote, Hegel says, wrote the Gospel of John in, uh, as defense or against Gnosticism, was trying to uh, diminish Gnosticism. Okay, comments or questions so far? You can see how I went down to a rabbit hole. I like your rabbit hole. Well, I, I would say that, yes, I have, I don't know if I'm a true Trinitarian. I believe, I, I don't know. I, I don't see Jesus as God. I see him as a part of God. Okay. We're, we're going to come back to that. <laughs> because we're going to deal a lot with the, the name of Jesus and how Jesus is portrayed in each of the Gospels, both the Synoptic and John. I explained that one time in here. I can explain it to you. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. People complicate that too much. I listen to these radio preachers and they complicate it too much. Okay. You take a pie. You split it into three times, three pieces. It's still a pie. The Lord God, Jehovah, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. That is the family of God. Okay? Yeah. God is a family. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's all God. Well, I think what Origen is saying is And if is you that, simplify it that way, you don't get confused. Yeah. Well, Origen would say, Origen would disagree with that. And all we're trying to point out is that there are different groups in the early Christian church that disagreed with it. And so our belief is, is whatever we choose to believe, but there, there is a historical... Uh, existence of groups that disagreed with that concept of, of them being all in one. I, I was always brought up on the, the concept uh, that God was like water, and there are different states. It, either you have ice, or you have water, or you have steam, but they're all basically water. 
their H2O. Okay. So, I mean, there are many examples of, of how you can conceive of the, the three in one. And the only point of this is not everybody just agrees with that. Not everybody in the early church or even today agrees with that. So there's also yeah. the analogy of the three blind men and the elephant. Yes. <laughs> yes. Saint Each, Patrick, uh, of course, used the shamrock as the symbol of God. Mm -hmm. say, say again. Saint Patrick used the shamrock. Oh, as yeah. The, yeah. Three leaves of the plant. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so let's get into the many names of Jesus. Um, and this is where we have a little fun. So there are some... <laughs> the rabbit hole. <laughs> Tatles says that there are differences between the Synoptic Gospels and John. And so we're going to take a look at some of those and let's see if, if we can justify her statement or, or not. So uh, the Gospels of Thomas versus the Gospel of John says these gospels speak for different groups of Jesus of Jesus' followers engaged in discussion, even argument toward the end of the first century. So that's really what we've just been talking about already. There are different groups that followed Matthew, Mark, and Luke and, and John and Thomas and a host of others. At issue, who is Jesus and what is the good news in Greek the Evangelion gospel? about him. What is the good news about him? So um, just like the picture there, some are pensive, some are looking to head upward word, and some are just trying to figure out where, where they are. Um, uh, gospel of Thomas versus the Gospel of John. Again, Thomas expresses the central theme of Jewish and Christian mysticism, Christian mysticism of a thousand years later, that the image of God is within everyone but most people are oblivious to his presence, okay? So this we talked about this a little bit last week. God is within us, all of us. That was, that was Thomas's point of view. John challenges the claim, says the light is in Jesus, and through him alone are we saved. And we hear that. We hear that quite commonly. John's views prevailed, and have shaped Christianity to this day. Probably, probably the majority opinion in Christianity, if there is such a thing as a majority opinion, is that there's only one way to salvation, and that's through, through Jesus. Okay, so now, comment? My, my thinking when I was reading about that was, you know, um, more of a human focus on it, not the spiritual. Mm -hmm. If if you got to go over here to get it, somebody can be in between and make make something out of it, make some kind of profit off of it. Yeah. But if it's in everybody, you can't make any money off of it. Yeah. And and that was kind of my one thought um, on the outside of all of the spiritual part was this could be used, you know, so. Well, and I, I think we, my... we all can think of examples in uh, in Christianity where people have, in fact, made money off of That's their theology. where I'm coming from, yeah. my historical. And because, and, and they want everybody to look to them only right. for, you know, and in fact, the, the Catholic Church at, at mm -hmm. one point in history, and still to a certain extent, expects that you go through the priest. Where the priest mm -hmm. has the answer. Right. <laughs> you don't investigate it yourself. Right. That's a little contrary to community of Christ. Very, very interesting if we had all felt it yeah. ourselves, where we would be today. Yeah, exactly. For me, historically, an interesting branch. Yeah. Okay, so now let's talk about some definitions. These are put forward by Pagels and other scholars. And uh, I, I don't claim it's exhaustive, but I tried to do my best to find every reference that I could. <laughs> Uh, this is another rabbit hole down. So, uh, Son of God, um, often it, it meant humans who have a special relationship with God, or uh, the, the nation of uh, Israel was called the Son of God. Solomon was called the Son of God. Angels and just pious men were called the Son of God 
and the kings of Israel were referred to as the Son of God. So that's not, at least by, according to the scholars, not a distinctive term referring to Jesus. Although it, it does. It, it does refer to him, but it's not distinctive just to him. Son of man meant mortal or human being or a mortal invested with divine power. Again, that can apply to uh, Jesus as well as other beings. And we're going to go through some scriptures on all these, by the way. Um, Messiah, uh, referred to the future king of Israel. Christos, or uh, the anointed one in Greek. <coughs> Christ in English. So, uh, and, and to be enthroned in Jerusalem. Messiah was to be enthroned in Jerusalem. Um, so all those terms are basically synonymous. Messiah, Christos, the anointed one, Christ, uh, etc. Lord is a translation of Kyrios, the Greek, the general Greek word for master. And that's used a few times too, where Jesus is referred to as master. King becomes the son of God when enthroned. I thought that was interesting. That, that's primarily uh, Jewish uh, uh, historical situation. He was, the king was concerned, considered the son of God when he was in front of or coronated. And son of heaven uh, was a term for biblical rules. The Roman emperors were also elevated to the position of God's Yes, when yes they that's, emperor. that's true. Jonathan? Yes. Uh, back to the previous slide. Yeah, we're back. Um, I'm not a Greek expert, but I suspect that those uh, words son of God, or at least son, and son of man were not capitalized in the original Greek. And if it's not capitalized, it to me, I think it changes uh, uh, the meaning of it somewhat. What do you think? I think I'm going to postpone that answer because I have an answer for it, but I'm not quite ready for it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Stay tuned. So we're, that's another rabbit hole I went down. So I, I, <laughs> I do want to hold that for just a little bit and we'll, we will talk about it. Okay. The leap from Thomas to John, again, according to Pagels. Recall that the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke characterize Jesus. Um, I think I... Uh, I don't think I finished that. I characterize Jesus as a as a human being, is what she says. Uh, the earliest of these gospels was Mark. Mark, written about 40 years after Jesus' death, 70 CE, presents that as a center mystery the question of who Jesus is. Now, I'm gonna show you why. Any any of you want to disagree with that before I show you why? <laughs> Is there anything, any biblical story you can think of that uh, puts Mark's central thesis as the question of who Jesus is? Well, probably the, the one where he questions Peter, who do you say that I am? Okay. Okay. And Peter got it wrong several times. Okay. Mark opens uh, his gospel saying, this is the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, I think back to the definition we just talked about, Messiah being the king who's going to be enthroned in Jerusalem, the son of God. He is announcing that God has chosen Jesus to be the future king of Israel. Because Mark writes in Greek, he translates the Hebrew term Messiah as Christos, the anointed one in Greek, which later in English becomes Jesus the Christ or Jesus Christ. So Jesus Messiah is the same as Jesus the Christ. And Hegel says, and other scholars tend to agree, that Messiah is a term for a human. It's a human term. The person who would come and free uh, Israel from its uh, persecutors and sit on the throne in, in Jerusalem. So here's, here's uh, the new... American Standard Bible. Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he questioned his disciples, saying to them, 
Who do people say that I am? This is right from the book of James, by the way, too. She just brought that issue. I got up. it right. Yeah. They told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others saying, Elijah, but others, one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. And again, in other some versions, that's, that's translated as the Messiah or the anointed one. Uh, and continuing on, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. He rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, which is often translated adversary, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Now, son of man here, it, it's capitalized in this version, the NA, NASB, um, but it, it also can mean human. I mean, for the most part, it's interpreted as meaning human. So uh, that this human must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders. Hegel says Peter protests in shock since he expects God's anointed one, Messiah, not to die, but to be crowned and enthroned in Jerusalem. Okay, that's a that's a interesting interpretation, at least. In the Hebrew Bible, Son of Man is often translated as mortal, human being or mortal. In Mark, Jesus uh, Jesus calls himself son of man. He too may simply mean human being. So we're on the verge of a controversy between whether Jesus is a human being during his life on, on earth or whether he is God in human form. You see how that, that comes about? And that's a, that's a debate that is carried on in the early Christian church. And probably has echoes even today. During Israel's ancient coronation ceremonies, the king is crowned and becomes God's representative, his human son or son of God. <laughs> so that's how Messiah is, is interpreted as being son of God. The term son of God is used in the Hebrew Bible as another way to refer to humans who have a special relationship with God. I mentioned that earlier, but I just wanted to repeat it. In Exodus, the nation of Israel is called God's firstborn son. Solomon is called son of God. Angels, just and pious men, and the kings of Israel are also called sons of God. And that's from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Comments so far? It's interesting that John refers to Jesus as the only begotten, and yet there's, you know, the scriptures are full of references to other people. Yeah. I mean, we think of ourselves as sons and daughters of God. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've heard that taught for years. Yeah. Um, so I don't know why John decided, well, you know, decided that Jesus was the only begotten. Is that like nobody else can be a child of God? Yeah. Well, keep keep in mind that, I mean, you're, you're hitting the, the nail on the head because Matthew, Mark, and Luke also view, all view him, according to the, the literature, as human. John says he's divine. From the very beginning of time okay. and that's why he applies that only begotten son of god well i always or, wondered if it meant there were other children that didn't come to earth that worked in heaven yeah. i bet in void in heaven those duties that's what i always kind of wondered well there may be something to that uh i I didn't get all the way through it. It was a little too academic for me, but Michael Heiser, the late Michael Heiser, was a biblical scholar and he wrote a book called The Unseen Realm, where he talks about the heavenly court. And he doesn't endorse um, um, polytheism, but he says the divine landscape is a little more complicated than we would like to think. And um, 
I wish I still had that book. I gave it away, but yeah, Michael Heiser. Okay. He's a, he was he's somebody you could look into. I'm, I'm pretty okay. Well, historically, uh, many rulers have assumed titles such as son of God. This is, I think, what uh, Paul was saying, and the son of a God and the son of heaven. And that comes from introduction to the science of religion. Matthew refers to Jesus as Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. So these are all additional names for Jesus. Master, <clears throat> the master, the Greek word uh, epistasis, epistates, hope that's close, is used only in Luke's gospel, where it occurs six times. As previously discussed, John refers to Jesus as logos, the word in English translations. So there are lots of lots of names for Jesus. And excuse my thing. That's not the right one. Okay. Uh, Messiah, uh, Matthew and Luke agree with Mark by describing Jesus both as a future king, Messiah, son of God, and as a mortal invested with divine power, son of man. So we've got this cluster of three saying, Messiah, son of God, son of man, all which have the implication of a human being. But Luke goes further. According to Luke in Acts, written 10 to 20 years later, Peter declares, uh, dares to announce to the men of Jerusalem that Jesus alone of the entire human race returned alive after death, and that this proves that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus who he crucified. So up, upon his return, he becomes Lord and Messiah. During his earthly days, according to the synoptics, he's a human being. Um, and I think I'll skip over this. It basically says the, the same thing. I, I just gave you the actual scripture, uh, but I, I'm watching the time and realizing we have a lot to cover. <laughs> so here's here's the rabbit hole that uh, Dennis mentioned, and that is that uh, the fonts used on the papyri written in Greek dated as early as the 4th century BCE, and that's before Christ, uh, was a biblical masculine. Mas, <clears throat> masculine. I can't even say it now. There's minuscule and majuscule. 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 I'll get it eventually. Ignore all previous pronunciations. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line, and what I probably should have said is, it's all caps. Isn't that easier to say? <laughs> so the the the, the biblical uh, manuscripts are all caps. It evolved from the letters that were carved in stone. They just didn't worry about lowercase. Uh, New Testament. They were shouting. Yes, that's true. In, <laughs> that's true. Uh, the New Testament texts first written in this form uh, date as early as the third century CE. And by the fourth century, the script uh, used by the majority of New Testament I read was a, was a refined uppercase, an elegant script with attention to sizing and placement of letters. However, pre sixth century, early, the earliest forms, this is a biblical te text, have no spacing between words, no punctuation, all caps. But there's something called a noma sacra, which I'll talk about in just a second here. And you can see right here, the little dash above that, that's in, an indication of a sacred term. So the only way that in the, the Greek that the manuscripts were written in, the only way you can tell it's a sacred term is if it has a little dash above it. Otherwise, if you look at that manuscript, there's no punctuation, there's no lowercase, the letters are right next to each other. Uh, and so here's another ex example of it. Uh, and it's that style is best seen in the Codex uh, Vaticanus. Vaticanus? I, 
I don't know Greek and I don't know the language, so I stumbled through this stuff, so please forgive me. But anyhow, it's one of four great uncial codices, codices uh, that basically are in all caps. Uh, and if you take a look here, you see the little dash? Okay, that means whatever that says, it refers to a sacred term. Interesting. There's lots of other little marks, plus signs, apostrophes, little carrots. There must be some kind of punctuation or something going on there. Uh, I don't speak Greek. It, it's Greek to me. Sorry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, all I'm relaying is what what I've read is that the early Greek manuscripts had no punctuation, and no, you can tell for sure it has no spacing. Uh, and then the only way this, yeah. The only way that sacred terms are designated is with that little translation. Yeah. Dash. So here's here's something. <laughs> Anyone care to translate that? Jesus went out along with the, the disciples to the village, villages of Caesarea Philippi, by and on the way, he questioned his disciples, saying to them, who do you people say that I am? That's all I want to read. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> well, you can read that. John the Baptist yeah. and others say Elijah, but other first, but others, son of the others prophet, one of the prophet. Okay, somebody else can. Do that. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Well, you get, them, you get the point. The this is why we have English majors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. 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 And can my guess is, you, it's a challenge for us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, my guess is that you know the scripture yeah. somewhat. Yeah. So, that helps. so that helps. Yeah. Um, but notice that again, everything I've read says that the words there are no spaces. They will wrap from one line to the next. They're not always on the same line. And again, it's it's meant to two things. First of all, if you're carving in stone, you're trying to get as much in there as you can. Secondly, if you're looking at papyrus or some expensive material to write on, you try to get as much in there as you can. And that's why no punct no punctuation, no upper lowercase, just all uppercase. Uh, and the only way that you know for sure uh, that is a sacred term is if you have a little, little dash. Now, I, I don't know if I included it in here or not, maybe I didn't, but there are, um, there are generally speaking, I think it's Bruce Metzger says there are about 15 sac sacred terms. Uh, and But he doesn't say whether or not words are always identified. So, for instance, you could have son of man, son of man with the son having the, 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 uh, dash. The dash. The dash. We'll call it the dash. It's easier. And man having, or it could have one or the other. So in other words, it's it's somewhat ambiguous about what are the sacred terms and which are which are not. And let me ask you: Does "son of man" mean something different to you than "son of man" with the son, the s or the m capitalized? Is there a difference between what the meaning is of that first and second example on the left hand side? Well, I think the lowercase son of man would be everybody. Yeah. And son of man would be a more spiritual. Okay. Yeah, like son of Jesus. man or son of God with the S's, G, the S and M capitalized. Both we would interpret today as being references to uh, divinity, specifically to Jesus. But what Pagels and others are saying is that was not the case. That was not always the case. That uh, sometimes uh, if you, you have no capitalization, no lowercase, then how do you know uh, which is which? Uh, you didn't have white out then. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> And okay, what is the meaning, you know, the bar over the term that, that renders it sacred? What did they mean by sacred? Well, I think I, I hope I put it in here. Yeah, I, I did. Okay, here are the uh, nomina sac sacra uh, Greek terms God, Lord, Jesus, Christ, Son, Spirit, David, Cross, Mother, Father, Israel, Savior, Man, Jerusalem, Heaven. Those are, are generally speaking, the, the 15 or so uh, terms that were 
mark this as sacred. And, and you can tell some of those are going to appear um, without the mark. And I, I guess what I want to get across is I don't, I don't read, read, read. As I look at things that have no indication that every time the Son of God is referred to, that it is a nominus sacra, you know, with a little dash of it. So it's it's hard to tell um, whether the original author knew or wanted to make those sacred terms. They're clearly sacred terms in some cases, not at all. Okay. Well, that version of the Bible that you're showing us today, that what was that version called again? The New American Standard Bible. That's the one that you think they got. They tried to get the closest to this. To the Greek. To yes. this new nomina sacra, whatever yeah. that word is. Nomina sacra. Yeah. Okay, well, here, here's the conclusion, I think. Um, and that tells me we got five minutes, even though the clock says we have seven. Um, I, I like this conclusion, which talks about uh, the history of Greek handwriting. It says, for the New Testament textual critic, knowing how to read these two forms of writing is essential, and knowing the history of their development helps resolve other questions that arise, arise regarding manuscript features and even variant readings. In other words, it becomes real clear why different versions of the Bible uh, have different wor words capitalized or use different terms. And as was said before, knowing this is essential to creating the critical Greek edition upon which the English Bible may, uh, many read is based. So, the next time you look at your favorite biblical passage in church or at home, you might also want to take a moment and consider the thousands of years of history that lie beneath the printed letters on the page, and how many, many people have had to have had their hand in interpreting and trying to figure out what that message was. Okay. So, is the next book we're going to study in this class how to, how to read Greek? Yes. <laughs> In fact, there's, Hebrew. Let's do Hebrew and then read. There's a there's a video series. For dummies. <laughs> Greek for dummies, yeah. That's funny. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's a video series on women in Greek that I'll bring in and we'll, we'll start spending time on that. I can't even do English. Uh, just for what it's worth, Jesus refers to Son of Man, is referred to as Son of Man. 29 times in Matthew, 14 times in Mark, 26 times in Luke, 69 times in the Synoptic Gospels, and 12 times in John. So, um, it, I'm sure John viewed that as, mm -hmm. as a sacred term. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke may not have. Because also God is called, uh, this is wrong. No, God calls Ezekiel. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. God calls Ezekiel. But thank you. My reading is poor. Son of man, 93 times. So the term is applied to other, other people. And we're talking with the capital letter. Pardon? And we're talking about that, that, that would be Hebrew. That would have been Hebrew. Okay. Yes, right, right. Does Hebrew have capital letters? Um, the I don't early... think so. I think the letters, the alphabet's all the same. I don't recall. Well, the earliest known, complete, fairly complete scripture is that uh, that uh, Codex uh, Vaticus, Vaticus. I can't say it. Yeah. It's the the it's the codex for the, for the Vatican has, and it was supposedly one of 50 copies that Const Constantine commissioned of the whole Bible. It Everything we've talked about in the Greek applies to that, oh, which okay. means it does have the little hash, or dash over the words. It does not have uh, spaces, and it's all capitalized. Does that answer the question, sort of? Yeah. Okay. So... Um, I think in Hebrew, the letters are all the same size. You read from right to left, and there are spaces between the words, at least yeah. modern Hebrew. Is there a way to know what is sacred word? No, I think that's a Greek, or like a Christian, probably the Christian yeah. writers identified that. Yeah. Well, and yeah. Well, the Hebrew doesn't have yeah. vowels in it no either, does it? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. 
That is correct. I knew that. But but our our Bibles are derived from the Greek manuscripts. Yeah. The the one that is held by the Vatican. Yes. Because while my ex could point. read Hebrew, he had trouble reading the sacred text that has no vowel. Yeah. Well, that's why we don't know if the original name for God was really Yahweh or Jehovah, because it's J W H in the Hebrew, and so you can derive well, either name from right. that. Well, and right. even today, and only, only the high sorry. priest knew the, the yeah. name. Uh, right. Even today, those that are that are religious Jews. Will not write G O D, but right. write yeah. G dash D. Right. right. Well, I, on this slide, I want to point out two things. I want to get in here quickly. Luke depicts Jesus as a man raised to divine status. John uh, basically says Jesus is a divine being who decide, descended to earth, temporarily taking on human form. And so that's the significant difference. Uh, John refers to Jesus nine times as Son of God. And let's see what else we got here. I'm, this is, uh, again, a reference to justify what I just said, but I, I'm going to skip over it real quick. And it gets into what they call high and low Christology. And basically, high Christology says that Jesus was, was divine first and became a man. And low Christology says he was a man and was uh, uh, revealed his divinity through his life. So, um, again, we're out of time. We've got lots more things. That you, you all know that Jesus is also refer, referred to as Agnes Day or Lamb of God and Savior. Uh, and so, I was determined to get to the slide. Paul, but you have I to hope you're quite correct. Chapter two, also. Oh. <laughs> Everybody in. Yeah. So, if we're high Christians or low Christians, depends on how we view Jesus. Yes. Yeah. 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 We have friends in low places when we're low Christians. Yes, that's, that's right. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I respect my my nephew's getting his PhD in theology, right. and he is studying Greek. Yeah. And now I see. Did she say why. that? She said she went and learned yeah, it, so she, she could read it. I think well, I they, think it's a requirement now for the PhD. Yeah, they they usually learn several languages, Greek and Hebrew, yeah, being, yeah. but Aramaic also. Yeah. Well, if I had another life to live, I would want to learn Greek, but I, but I don't. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. We are. Thank you. Wow. The time is. It's a little bit Looney Tunish. You know, it's like, are we really? You think that's going with the that's, that's not appropriate. That's all. Well, I was, I was afraid that after all this talk about minuscule and majuscule and you know, <laughs> you'd be a little loony. <laughs> all of your brilliant words have just gone right out. To I yes, say, right now right. we're right. thinking of porky pigs. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank we're you. No, I was 16, thinking of bunny. minutes after, so that's not too awfully bad. So porky pig was here.